it, it's a great honor to be here. Gabriela, thank you. That was a very generous introduction, and I, it's been wonderful following your work, actually. She did some of the, the earliest pioneering work on, on smuggling, on human trafficking, but also migrant smuggling between the United States and Mexico, and you've really developed that out in a comparative way. Um, uh, now looking at Europe and Africa and the Middle East, and so it's been great to follow your work, and, and thank you, Andrew Geddes, for the invitation to be here. Um, you've done amazing things here with MPC, and we're very proud at MPI to, for the many points of contact that we have together. Um, and I also want to recognize my colleague Liz Collette, although you've already heard from her because she moderated the last panel, but she's the director of, of MPI Europe um, and, and with us today. Um, I am going to speak about immigration policy in the United States rather than globally, and, and I'm very mindful that I'm in a room full of people who know migration in Europe and in this hemisphere um, extremely, extremely well. And so out of an excess of caution, I'm going to stick on my side of the Atlantic here. Um, but I, I have a colleague, Aaron David Miller, who likes to say that history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Um, and it, that's sort of true in terms of, of policy context as well, which is hopefully some of the things that, that I'm talking about are not repeating themselves on this side of the Atlantic, but perhaps they rhyme a bit. I think there will be some echoes of things that will, will perhaps sound familiar, though the contexts are different. In fact, multiple contexts in Europe um, for some of the, the similar things happening, but not the same things happening. Um, and I want to talk about why immigration politics has become such a hot topic in the United States. Um, this is an issue that is perhaps the most salient issue in public debate today in the United States. I mean, we have a president who tweets about it regularly because, of course, tweeting has become the primary form of communication for policymakers and how you make policy pronouncements. Um, he says somewhat sarcastically, but, but it, is, it is true. Um, you know, his, his biggest and, and most celebrated promise on the campaign trail among his core supporters was to build a wall on the border with Mexico to keep out immigrants, occasionally keep out drugs and keep out trade and a few other things, but primarily about immigrants. Um, we've seen a huge emphasis on immigration enforcement. Um, it is not actually quite as much of a break with the past. We just did a major report on this as it would look on paper. And in fact, when you look at it, they're having a, a very hard time ramping up uh, deportations to the degree that they have wanted to do. But it is ramping up. And we can talk more about that if you want. But it is certainly increasing, and it's certainly significant. Um, and we're seeing some things we had never seen before as, a, as policy. We'd seen them happen, but not as policy. Prosecuting first-time border crossers, for example, in criminal courts, or separating children and families in, in intentionally. It had happened in the past. can't say it never happened. But as a policy to do this, um, we had not seen that before. It's not clear that immigration is important to the average American as it is to Donald Trump. Okay, I mean, it, it is further, it may be his number one issue, and he is the, the tweeter in chief, and so he does have the ability to, to set the policy agenda on this. But when you look at policy priorities among Americans in general, it does come a little further down in the depth chart. It's important, but it's not at the top. And it, it also isn't clear that most Americans share his point of view on this and the way of addressing this. Most Americans actually, um, and, and Miriam has, has a lot of data on this, obviously, for the work that she's done, but most Americans actually have positive attitudes towards immigration and even towards the, the general level of immigration. And, and there's a certain level of ambivalence in it, but generally positive. There is a minority of Americans that's deeply worried or even angry about immigration. And that's a group that's been central to Trump's political campaign and ultimately to his presidency. So though it's a small minority, it's just, when I say small, it's not that small. It's anywhere between 20 to 35 percent, depending how you count it. Um, it, is a, it is a minority that is very fundamental for the president. And, and we should pay attention to that minority because it is, it is a group of people that matters. Even if we had a different president, it would matter for setting policy in the United States. Um, I have a book that came out earlier this week, which Gabriela referenced, called Vanishing Frontiers, The Forces Driving Mexico and the United States Together. It literally came out on Tuesday before I got on a plane. Um, and it's not explicitly about immigration, but immigration runs through it all the way. And, and it runs through it in part because you know, Mexicans are the single biggest immigrant group in the United States. They're about a third of all immigrants, actually about a quarter of all immigrants in the United States. So not by no means a majority, but, but the largest single group. And no longer the largest group coming into the United States. Recent migration, there's actually more from China and India than from Mexico into the United States. So, I mean, the patterns have changed significantly. Um, but when you talk about immigration in the United States, it often comes down to talking about Mexican unauthorized immigrants. Okay, and that, there's a sense in our mind that immigration is synonymous with Mexican unauthorized immigrants. That's about an eighth of the immigrant population. Okay, so we're getting, it's actually a little less than an eighth. 
Um, and this goes to a point that was made earlier today, which I think is significant, we'll probably hear again and again, which is when we talk about immigration, we're actually talking about lots of different things, right? Immigration is a big category. Um, we're actually talking about lots and lots of different things that often get conflated in a single conversation. And the conversation in the United States has really come down often to that one-eighth of immigration, which is a very important group and a group that, that I've spent a, a great deal of time on, but, you know, and, 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 and think merits specific attention, but nonetheless is a piece of the pie. It's a piece of the larger immigration phenomenon. And this, and this happens in all of our countries, right, in one way or another, that there are certain things that become a lightning rod and ultimately they consume the oxygen and they become central to the debate overall. Um, the book starts with a story, and, and at the risk of telling a story at an academic conference, um, it starts with the story of Hazleton, Pennsylvania. Um, Hazleton, Pennsylvania, does it, has anyone heard of Hazleton, Pennsylvania? Hazleton, yes. Hazleton was, in the United States, the center of the anti-immigration movement back in 2006. It was the, the city that, that used local laws, what we call ordinances, um, to try and, and stop people renting apartments and houses to people who couldn't prove their legal residency in the United States or giving them jobs. And they used local laws to do this. It had been done at a federal level, but it had never been done at a local level. It was struck down in the courts. Um, the courts ruled that local governments didn't have that jurisdiction that belonged to the federal government. But 2006, 2007, Hazleton, Pennsylvania was ground zero for protests for and against immigration. The national news camped out in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. And I ended up there because there's a great story actually, which, which I'm not gonna go into, but there's actually now four Mexican owned factories that provide employment in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. And so there's sort of this shift between Mexican immigration and ultimately then Dominican immigration, um, and then Mexicans becoming employers who are hiring American workers. But, but it's also a fascinating story in terms of how Hazleton has come to terms and not come to terms with immigration. And it mirrors in many ways things that are going on across the United States. Hazleton's an old coal mining town, and the, and the coal mine started to shut down in the 1950s. And so it's a, a town that went into a, a prolonged decline economically. And the next generations would leave, actually population started to decline because young people couldn't find jobs and would leave and, and move out. Um, and it's a town that has a huge imprint of, of immigrant history. It's a town that was a gateway for Eastern European and Italian and Irish immigrants. And as you walk down the street, my, I remember going to Hazleton about eight years ago for the first time. And I've gone there innumerable times since. I mean, it's really a fascinating, and, and I would actually, I'll say at the end, it's actually a hopeful story in the end. I mean, it, it is a city that is fascinating in many ways. But one of the things I remember walking down is you see the, the religious denominations, you can see the ethnic his, history of Hazleton on it. So Serbian Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox, Ukrainian Catholic, never the twain shall meet, Irish Catholic, Italian Catholic, Welsh Primitive Methodist, never seen that before, Tyrolean Catholic, the only Tyrolean Catholic church in the world, or at least in the United States, but I think in the world outside of Italy and Switzerland was, was in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. Um, this is a city that wears its immigrant and its ethnic heritage on its sleeve. But something started to happen when Mexican and then Dominican immigrants started to move in and then other Latin American immigrants started to move in in the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, and today the city's about half Latino, not all immigrant by the way, half of Latin American descent, half immigrant families. Uh, and important to talk about immigrant families because they, a lot of them have children that were born in the United States. Right, so uh, in fact, when they came in, most of these families had lived in the New York, New Jersey area. So many of them already had US born children. But immigrant families are about half of the city. So from the mid-1990s to now, the town turned over almost completely demographically. Half of the town um, is made up of immigrant families of Latin American heritage. It's a very fast change. Now, that's surprising in a place like Hazleton. You know, there's been a lot of immigration in large cities in the United States throughout history. You go to New York, you go to Washington, D.C., you go to Chicago, L.A., San Francisco. These are Houston. These are cities that have had lots and lots of immigration all the time. And, and if it wasn't immigration from abroad, it was migration, or rural to urban migration, migration from smaller towns to big cities. In terms of the imagined community, the boundaries expanded constantly. In a place like Hazleton, there had been very few people moving in. And so a sudden influx of people over a short period of time generated quite a rapid reaction. Now some of the reactions are good. It, when you walk down Hazleton, even the, the eight or so years that I've been going there, you can see that it's a city renewed. There are small businesses everywhere. When I started to go there, the downtown was still half boarded up. The downtown is back, it's beautiful. There's another business district that's amazing there. Um, there's actually 60 new businesses in the last five years, according to official statistics. But almost all those businesses have Spanish language names on them. Now, this shouldn't surprise us because we know in the United States that immigrants are twice as likely as native-born Americans to start a business. 
I mean, this is, is a lot of research has been done around this, although no one can quite explain it. We assume a lot of it has to do with the entrepreneurship that comes with people who have traveled far to get to another place. And it's one of those stories that we don't talk about enough. Um, but something has to do also with barriers to entry, right? People who had a good job somewhere else. And I talked the other day to an accountant who runs a, an African restaurant in a Midwest town. And he does it because it was, he couldn't become an accountant in that town. It was his pathway into the middle class. Right? So a lot of this is entrepreneurship, a lot of this is the innovation that comes with people who move, but some of it is getting around barriers that exist as well. But this is a town transformed, and everyone you talk to, even native-born Hazeltones, will tell you this is a much better place economically than ever existed. It's vibrant for the first time in, since the 1950s. But there were some, some other, and about half, by the way, about, you've probably heard this, about half of the Fortune 500 companies in the United States were started either by immigrants or their children. And that's against 25% of Americans who are either immigrants or children of immigrants. So there, there's something in that chip there about immigration. But the city's also faced some strains on its institutions, including its schools, for example, as it tried to cope with people with parents who didn't speak English and some children who didn't speak English and didn't really have the capacities yet set up to do that. Or emergency rooms that were trying to deal with people who didn't speak English as well. And you know, when you talk to people who are native-born Hazeltonians, mostly white Hazeltonians, they will tell you that you know, this was one of their, their points of frustration, was suddenly having to put money into services because people had arrived. It becomes one of the touch points that leads to the anti-immigration legislation. The other thing was crime. And this is odd because there's a number of studies, actually quite a number of studies at this point on crime, and there's actually a correlation between immigration and lower crime in the United States. Immigrants are much less likely to commit crimes, and cities that immigrants move into usually see a drop in crime rate. It's not necessarily causation in that case, but, but correlation. Um, but we do know that immigrants themselves, and that includes unauthorized and authorized immigrants, commit many fewer crimes than native-born Americans. Doesn't hold for the second generation. They become like the rest of us, but, but it does hold for the first generation. Um, Hazleton, however, was strange because a lot of these families, almost all these families, were coming from New York. So there were a number of teenagers who had been in gangs in New York that moved in, into a city that hadn't seen that before. So there's about a 10-year period where crime does go up, and then it goes back to normal again. That becomes a second touch point. And there's a third touch point around work. And there's no evidence that I've found so far that immigrants in Hazleton compete with native-born workers. And most people actually won't claim that either. But what you do find is that people worry about their jobs. This is a working class town. They're not necessarily telling you that, they, that an immigrant took their job, which you do hear in other parts of the United States, whether it's true or not. And there's a lot of evidence that that's probably not true, but could be true on, on the least skilled, uh, in the least skilled positions, but not true in other, in other positions. Anyone has a high school degree and above, probably not. But there's an enormous fear that jobs are changing. And I think we have to take this seriously. The world of work is changing. Because of automation, because of technology, jobs are disappearing. That's great for those of us in the room, because those of us in the room, for the most part, have the skills that allow us to take advantage of that. In fact, it's really helpful for most of us, because we're in, the, we're in positions that will morph and will be really interesting for the rest of our lives, because there will be more and more things that we can do. But it's terrifying if you don't have a college education. If you're in your 40s or 50s and you're not necessarily technologically savvy, and you see your kids sitting all the time on their smartphone, but you can't do that, and suddenly they're looking for people to program machines at the factory, right? So this, this is, immigration becomes not something where people say it's taken their jobs, but it's one more thing they don't want to have to compete against if they have to compete against. It's one more thing that people worry about in terms of their future, and it comes up a lot talking with folks. Um, but then there's, you get to the heart of the matter the more you talk to people, and the comment you hear the most often is, you know, the city's gotten better, but it's no longer my city, right? And it goes back to what we heard on the first panel this morning. It's that sense of identity, right? And how identities change, and identities change slowly. And we all have, our, have identities, multiple identities that change slowly, right? No matter who we are. Um, in Hazleton, I would say there was a very healthy identity that allowed people to survive the collapse of an industry, that allowed people to have a sense of survival and a sense of, of really being still important in the world, even though the world had left them behind. This is actually healthy. I mean, it actually kept people together. There are traditions. There are uh, relationships built up. There are ways of thinking about themselves built up that allowed people to go through a really tough time and still be optimistic about the future. But that identity is changing as new people move in. And, and the boundaries is not an identity that was easy to change over time, right? And so the first thing you see is, 
is that sense of displacement. And, and this sense of displacement is repeated in small and medium-sized cities around the United States, which had not seen immigration. And much of the immigration in the 2000s was to small and medium-sized cities, a lot of it resorting, a lot of it people moving from big cities into smaller towns, sometimes people moving directly. And a huge increase in the number of immigrants living in smaller and medium-sized towns that didn't have a template for changing their identity in a fluid way. And, and there's this challenge to the sense of identity and how over time, Amy Chua calls it, calls it tribal identities, and Miriam said, used that term this morning as well. She has a book called Political Tribalism, which talks about you know, our first reaction when, when someone challenges a, a hard-won, hard-wired identity is to push back, right? Is to feel threatened by it. Now that may change over time. Over time, identities do change, actually. But it, that's not the initial reaction for most of us. And, and we need to take that seriously as something that is happening. There's also something happening broader across the United States. And, and it has to do with, with the white working class. And the working class is variably defined. And the Trump election has, has called this out. There have now been a number of academic works on this. Um, but the, the, the white working class is, is alternately identified either by those that don't have a college degree or those that work in certain kinds of occupations don't, don't require a college degree. It's a large part, it's about half of the United States is white and working class. That's a large part of the United States. But it's a, a part of the United States that increasingly feels that their skills are less relevant and will be less relevant in the future and is worried about that. And it's a population that once was the center of American culture and American politics and, and every moment that goes past feels less part of that. If you turn on the radio today, if you turn on the TV, American culture is increasingly influenced by cities. I happen to like that, right? I mean, I'm from the city, so I'm from Washington, D.C. Um, but the reality is increasingly a national culture is urban culture in the United States. And the white working class has worried a great deal about being left behind. Um, one of the things that has been fascinating in the past two years, there have been a number of polls that have found that whites without a college degree feel they're discriminated against more than African Americans, Latinos, or Asian Americans. That's surprising. It's also objectively not true, okay? I mean, there, there are all sorts of studies you can do and have been done looking at everything from average income to educational attainment to incarceration rates to housing that show that there still are discrimination patterns that are very fixed, and particularly for African Americans and Latinos, and to some extent, for some, in some areas for Asian Americans, continue on. The gap has closed, yes, but continue to be very significant. But it's not necessarily the perception in the white working class. The sense is that they're losing out in terms of national culture. They turn on the basketball game. Not a lot of white players in the basketball game. And these people are heroes, right? I mean, basketball players are heroes. Football players are heroes. Turn on music. And, you know, the latest fad, maybe a song, it's half in Spanish. Right? And so this, the national culture is changing in a way that doesn't necessarily, and we can argue that's good. I'm not saying this is bad. On the contrary, we're becoming a much more plural society. But in that process, those identities change very slowly. And the immediate reaction, again, often is threat rather than integration. Um, and until recently, you did not have political candidates who actually tapped into this. You had it with Bernie Sanders, the Democratic Party, and you had it with Donald Trump. Much of Donald Trump's message was precisely um, to say that, that he was bringing back a coalition of working class whites into politics. And it was very effective. Um, some studies call this status anxiety. I don't, I don't love that term. And some people just talk about plain racism, which clearly is present in a lot of this. Um, but it's more than that. It's the intersection of three things. I mean, it's the challenge to what I think is the most complicated, the challenge to hard-won, hardwired identities. It's about economic insecurity. Whether it's competition with immigrants, it's the general economic insecurity, the sense of loss of place. And, and there's a little bit of fight over burden on public services. That's there, and it comes through. Now, some of these fears are going to go away on their own. Um, the public service burden eventually goes away. Over time, you actually see in the school systems, the initial challenges that rapid immigration does cause on services does change over time. In Hazleton, that's changing very quickly. You also see, actually, a lot of people in the next generations mixing together. And, and polls tell us that younger people, are, even, in, even in the white working class, even in rural and small town America, are much more open to different ethnic identities. I'd love to cross that with, with uh, uh, Miriam's data on that as well. But from the data I've seen, certainly we see this across the board, that there's actually a change, a generational change that's significant in terms of identity. And I remember sitting in a cafe in Hazleton, actually, one of my last visits to Hazleton, 
and listening to two of the, the, the workers in the cafe, one speaking in Spanish and one speaking in English, and both of them understanding each other and thinking, you know, even in Hazleton, this is actually changing very quickly. And it's changing. I've been in a few groups of young people in Hazleton who are white and Latino. And by the way, many of the Latinos are, are of African descent also. So there's race and ethnicity kind of and immigration crossover here. And, and increasingly on the next generations, you do see people actually getting together in new forms of way. So time takes care of some of this. Um, but time, you know, in the long run, everything will be okay, but in the long run, we're all dead, right? I mean, in the long run, Mark Twain used to say, um, it, you know, this will take care of itself, but it can be a very long process to take care of itself. Um, there are some other things. The world of work worries me um, because I think we're in for a period where many people will worry about what they're going to be doing 10 years from now if they're still going to be relevant. And I think that's a wild card in terms of how we relate to each other. When people feel under threat, Again, it's not the question of whether can people compete with immigrants, but if people feel under threat, they worry about globalization, they worry about trade, they worry about immigration, they worry about machines. And of those, by the way, the only one that you can't curse is a machine, right? The only inanimate object is the machine. So you, you begin to think about it's the other people outside who are taking your jobs, it's the immigrants. That's one that we should worry about because I think the more people feel insecure, and they have a real reason. This is not people making it up. They have a reason to feel insecure about their jobs. I think we, we should be concerned. Um, we know, of course, um, most of the things I've talked about can't actually be dealt with through immigration policy, but I'd like to end by talking about immigration policy because we're in a group of people who think about immigration policy. I mean, you can't deal with mechanization of work through immigration policy. You can't really deal with tribal identities thoroughly through immigration policy. You know, these are all things that require different sorts of treatment. But there are things in immigration policy that help us manage some of these pushback factors better than others. And so thinking that it matters to have legitimacy in immigration policy, that it does matter whether societies embrace, or you get the kind of reaction we got in the United States, right? Where we're suddenly, and by the way, the United States is a bit of an anomaly, right? Political systems, anyone a political scientist here? Of course, Andrew is. Yes, and Layla, good. Glad to know a few other political scientists. You know, part of the accident of Trump's victory is our, is our presidential system. I mean, yes, it's the Electoral College, and, and he won fewer votes than Hillary Clinton, but also he took over the Republican Party, right? I mean, he took over a party that's less than a third of American voters. You know, if, if we had had a parliamentary system, he would be Marine Le Pen, right? He would be the Danish folk party. He would be the Danish popular party. He would have 20, 25% of votes. He'd be an important politician in parliament. Right? The nature of the system matters in this case. So he won a majority of a minority. He really had a minority and eventually construct a majority of a minority party. Um, but nonetheless, having a large group of people who, who do not, who are seriously concerned about immigration is not good for the legitimacy of the immigration system. Um, and so doing a few things. One, as we've looked at U.S. immigration policy, one is taking seriously labor market needs, thinking what the labor market of the future looks like and not assuming that it's always going to be good for everyone, that it's good for the net average, but none of us live on the net average. And so it's good to look at, are there spaces in the economy where competition is possible, not only in a good economy, but in a bad economy? Um, looking at how fast, what are the right numbers of people to come into the country, and taking that seriously and going back and revisiting that. I'm not concerned about it, but it's a debate we're having with colleagues about should we think of the overall immigration levels. And interestingly enough, the colleagues who are closest to the labor movement are the ones who are most concerned about the numbers, actually. I'm not personally, I'm not saying we should revisit it, but, but it is something we should take seriously, is thinking about overall numbers. Um, the pace of change matters. I mean, we know this, and a lot of academic research has been done on this. Quicker changes have more effect in negative reactions than slower changes. So thinking about pace of change matters. And obviously, unauthorized flows matter more than authorized flows. And one of the things we've done is gone back to the drawing board after having spent a lot of time you know, t dealing with unauthorized flows and saying we should actually be spending a lot of our time thinking about the legal immigration system, which is how most people come through and then thinking about how we deal with the unauthorized population through the legal immigration system. But we should lead with a conversation about the legal immigration system. You know, um, it, it has much more uh, uh, weight in the conversation, but it's also actually, when you get to the nuances, how most people are coming through. And that's actually where we want to shape things to go. Let me come back to one last story, and with that I'll end. Um, sometimes you also need incredible leadership to build bridges between newcomers and the native born. And, and one of the things that happened in Hazleton, it's kind of fun, is a guy named Joe Madden um, is from Hazleton. And Joe Madden is the manager, the coach 
of, of the Chicago Cubs, which was a, were a hapless team. For 100 years, they couldn't win the World Series. They were cursed. They called themselves cursed. And they suddenly won the World Series with Joe Madden as their manager. And he'd actually been managing another team doing very well before that. But he's from Hazleton. And the world of baseball, by the way, is an immigrant world. About a third of the players are Latino immigrants in the world of baseball. And he came back to Hazleton a few years ago and discovered how divided his town was. He doesn't spend as much time as he used to, but he's royalty in Hazleton, as he should be. And he comes back and discovered how, how divided the city was. Um, and he began getting together. His cousin, as it happens, is a community activist and very close to a lot of the Latino leadership in the city. And so he began to get together with people. And they ended up coming with something called the Hazleton Integration Project, where they started trying to bring together old time residents of the city with new time residents and beginning to craft a new narrative about what it means to be from Hazleton. And this has been significant. I mean, it, it was not simply the idea of getting people in the same room, but pre-thinking the, the, the narrative. It's going back to that issue of identity and tribalism. How do we expand the boundaries of what it means to be from this place? You know, and beginning to do, um, and this was what Elias talked about earlier today. I don't see you, Elias, but if you're here. Um, the notion also of connecting the present to the past because his recognition when he came back is he, he went, he tells the story, he went to an evening at, at a Dominican family's house and says, and there were three generations and there was music playing and people were running around, the kids were running around. And he said, this was us growing up in an Italian family. He said, this is exactly the way Hazleton was at a different point in his history. And so the way of addressing the narrative has been connecting the present to the past and saying what is gonna make Hazleton a great city in the future is not denying its immigrant present, but actually harnessing its immigrant past and its immigrant present. Its ethnic diversity, in fact, and that ethnic diversity includes everyone, because everyone has roots somewhere else. Everyone is part of that deep, rich tapestry of immigrant identity. You may not recognize it initially, but you know, if, you're, if you celebrate your Italian last name and you eat, still eat Italian food when you get together with a family because that's what you did with your grandparents, so when you see your siblings, that's what you still do, you know, hey, that's the same thing as Dominicans or Mexicans are doing, right? This begins, this is the continuity. It's not a break with the past. And they've been surprisingly effective at harnessing the past and the present to try and construct a new narrative. So policies matter, but leadership also matters. And I should say, by the way, when I say leadership, it's not just Joe Madden, it's everyone else there. Joe was the star power, but everyone else. I mean, there is a Latino leadership. There is a other native-born leadership in Hazleton that have been behind that, who've actually done the hard work and made this happen. And so, yes, it's important to do this, but also leadership and thinking about narratives and thinking about narratives that tie present and past are incredibly powerful ways of getting through some of the most nettlesome, most difficult, and greatest resistance that we see today to immigration. So thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew, for that. Amazing presentation. I have a, already a ton of questions, and I'm sure that our audience does as well. And I think I'm just going to touch back on what was part of the, the last part of your, of your keynote, which is precisely this pace, and how fast we see some of these experiences changing. You know, I remember how in your book you talk about um, the uh, Mexican family and how the um, the guy from Puebla, I don't remember, oh, yeah. like, you know, how Don yeah. Demetrio, you know, looks back at, at the fact that he had to migrate, but that was not the case for the rest of the family, one, just one generation later, you know. So how some, of, some, how some of those demographic changes have taken place at the speed and the pace at which they, they take place. And I think part of the conversation that we had this morning had precisely to do with how do we change, how do we counter a lot of these narratives, <laughs> and how we, you know, we, we have these amazing gatherings, you know, where we come together, um, but we leave many times without those answers. How do we change the narrative? How do we counter with our data, with all of the research that we that we carry out? Um, how how can we recraft some of, of these messages that we see that are, are so prevalent? Um, I think you know, not only in the case of um, Hazeltown, but also you know, growing up on the border in Arizona, mm -hmm. how we went from Sheriff Jarapayo and the fear that that created to a community where you know now there's a completely different sheriff and some of you know some of the, the participation that that led to um, the. 
murder a couple of uh, weeks ago of an indigenous woman, you know, on the border, and the kind of reaction that that also generated, you know, on, on you know, the community. So my question would be, and um, I'm just going to throw it out there so that we can, as an audience, ask even more questions. How can we learn? What can we learn from that experience? What does the migrant experience and rechanging narratives <laughs> tell us about the way? Um, in, in policy and in, in academia, we are, we are to change narratives as well. Yeah, I, I think the role of, of scholars and policy analysts is critical in this, as well as advocates and others in the, in the field and intergovernmental organizations. I mean, I think it matters having good data and good research out there. I think it matters enormously. Um, these debates are often led with really bad information, um, the, those who push back against immigrants. Um, there, it's not sufficient to have good data and good evidence. I, I, you know, I, I, I would be naive to say that. Um, but it is important to do it. And it, it also empowers those who are on the front lines. You know, I often think in, in policy research and academia, we, we, we can do a great job of getting to policymakers. We can't always shape the general public. But we can give data to other people who do have more access to it. And sometimes we can get to the general public. I mean, the, through the media, through publications that actually tell a story, we can get to a general public. Part of the reason I wrote this book, this is not an academic book, it's a book of stories, as I like to say, was because I wanted to tell stories about the U.S.-Mexico relationship backed up by data, um, but actually do it in a narrative way that could be useful and reach a different audience than, than, than we usually reach from the think tank world. But I, I think data and research is fundamental. You know, I, th I think it's good to have it out there. There's a lot of misinformation out there on, on immigration and criminality. There's a lot of in, 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 misinformation, lack of information, immigrants and innovation, for example. I mean, just the, 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 the stories people tell are often wrong, and if we don't correct them, and if we don't put things out there and put it in people's hands to use, the, the wrong information will continue to be used. Um, I also think immigrant groups themselves, I mean, I think a lot of this happens naturally. One, one of the things in the U.S. that's made enormous difference, too, is, is frankly, I mean, there's so much intermarriage in the U.S. Um, between, not, not so much immigrants, but children of immigrants and non-immigrants. Um, children of Latin American and Asian immigrants have very high intermarriage rates. That even the ethnic boundaries are being redefined, and we're going to look back 20 years from now and realize how much changed. Um, the, and the other thing, just to the point you made, is, is migrants are also incredibly important actors in development. And then the story, this, this book opens with the story of Demetrio Juarez, who, who is a Mexican immigrant and, and runs a really fabulous restaurant in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. He runs a really good restaurant, if you ever go there. Um, but he, uh, uh, you know, he, he's the only one in his family who migrated, him and his father. Um, and they put the rest of the family, the rest of his siblings, through school. So he has, of his six siblings, five of them went to college. And all six of them stayed back in the state of Puebla in Mexico. Um, and I visited them, and you know, they have a good quality of life, actually. I mean, you know, they were able to invest in their home communities. And I have a chapter in here about uh, migrants from Zacatecas starting businesses in Zacatecas, and you see a huge drop. Today, there's very little, by the way, despite the fact that Mexican authorized immigration is our stalking horse for immigration debates, there are very few Mexicans that actually migrate without legal papers to the United States anymore. There, there's a large group of Central Americans, but it's still a relatively small group. And there's a lot of visa overstayers. But we actually, unauthorized immigration, despite what you hear you know, in the headlines and in the tweets of our president, are, is in fact down to, to historically low levels in the United States. It still happens. I mean, it hasn't gone away. And there is, there is a real debate to be had about what we do with unauthorized immigration over time and whether we take care of it by finding legal pathways, doing better border controls. I mean, these are legitimate arguments that reasonable people can disagree on and try and reach a compromise. Um, but it's gone down a lot, and it went down a lot in Mexico, you know, because of a lot of things that happened in terms of the Mexican economy over time, but also because migrants invested in their home communities and in their families, right? And it's one of those things we sometimes miss in the migration debate is how powerful the, the economic incentives that migrants have themselves to help their families and their communities. And fortunately, in the case of Zacatecas, for example, the, the government actually got involved in matching funds to start businesses. And you see a huge effect of, of business creation in the state. Yeah. Thank you so much.